So this video is the uh, free response questions on practice test number two. And the first question, first two, are where you're allowed to use a calculator. <clears throat> so we've got this graph here, increasing function, they say, uh, domain of all real numbers greater than two, and the points three, zero, and six, three are on the graph. So we can three, zero, and six, three. And there's no other really nice points on the graph. And now uh, they have a second function. That one they don't show us a graph of, but they just tell us. 9 over <clears throat> x minus 3. And now they start asking questions about it. So question A1, uh, composite function. So the way we do that uh, for A1 is they want to know what h of 6 is. And h of 6 is g of f of 6. And f of 6, apparently, is 3. And g of 3, when you plug in, is 9 over 3 minus 3, which is 9 over 0, which is undefined. And that's why uh, a is undefined. Okay, let's look at B. B says, finds all values for which g of x equals negative 5.8. So here for B, we're talking about negative 5.8 is equal to 9 over x minus 3. Uh, I personally would cross multiply. Minus 5.8x minus... Uh, plus, because it's, uh, that's 15, that's 17.4. Uh, Subtract 17.4 from both sides. Probably minus 8.4. And finally divide. Probably should have been using a calculator all throughout, but I'm using it just for the division. Hopefully my answer is right. And it's uh, 1.448, something like that. Okay, so that's A and B. No, that was, I, 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 I realize I only did A1 and I did B1. But what about A2? Find all real zeros of f. Well, from the graph, the zero is also the x-intercept. So a2 is just at 3. That's the only x-intercept. So this was b1. b2 says determine the end behavior of g, that's this, as it decreases without, as, as x decreases without bound. So what they're getting at here for B2 is what's the limit as X goes to negative infinity of um, G of X. Now, if you were to graph 9 over X minus 3 on your graphing calculator, it would look like that. So when they're asking what's happening, what's the end behavior, this thing, as X gets bigger and bigger negative decreases without bounds the function is getting closer and closer to zero now c uh, c1 wants to know if this function's f is invertible it's invertible if it passes what's called the horizontal line test because that way each um if if it passes the horizontal line test and then you take the inverse where you interchange the x and y values and you reflect it, um, then that would pass the vertical line test. So basically this thing, yes, yes, it is invertible. Give a reason based on the definition of a function 
I would say that uh, pass, uh, this is what I would say, passes or no two points are on or have the same Y coordinate. That's what makes it invertible. Okay, that wasn't bad. Move on to question number two. The table gives the number of cones of ice cream sold by a food vendor. So the first day, just 14. 35 days later, they start getting some business. 57, still not a lot of ice cream cones. And then on the 45th day, it went down to 46. So, oh, they, they say it can be modeled by a quadratic function. Because imagine you made a graph of this. It would go like that. And then after 35 days, it would go up to 57. But after 45, it's down to 46 or some kind of. So they say that it can be modeled by a quadratic equation. Use the given data to write three equations. So three points on this quadratic equation are 0, 14, 35, 57, and 45, 46. Now the way that you, um, the way that you, you take the equation, y, the form of it is y equals a t squared or x bx plus c. Now you take each of these three things, in test one they did this with exponential, now with quadratic you need three points, you put 14 in for the y value, and you put zero in for the t value. You do that for all three points. So you put 57 in for y, and you get a times 35 squared plus b times 35 plus c, and finally, 46 equals a times 45 squared plus b times 45 plus c. So those are uh, the three equations. Now, the way you find the answer, well, for one thing, this top equation just becomes 14 equals c. So we actually have one third of the answer. Now, to get the values of A and B, I am going to change these C's into 14's and subtract from each equation 14 from both sides. So now I end up with, um, subtract 14 from 57, get 43. Now, 35 squared, I think it's 12, 25, plus 30. Whoop, that's A, plus 35B. When I subtract 14 from both sides here, I get 32 equals 2025A plus 45B. So, so they want us to actually equate, yeah, they want us to, to, to solve for A and B. Um, what I would do, these are pretty large numbers, actually. So... It's not that clear what the common multiple is of 35 and 45, or of 20, 25, and 12. So I'm going to do something that always works, although it does lead to some large numbers. This is, um, these, these numbers are pretty large, and this is kind of annoying, but here we go. So 45 times 43, 1935. 45 times 12 is 25. Whoa. And 45 times 35. On the other hand, 35 times 32. 35 times 20 is 25. And we should get the 1575b. Subtract these two equations, 1935 minus 1120 is 815. 
and five five one two five minus seven zero eight seven five is negative one five seven twenty a divide both sides by negative one five seven twenty And so on this side, do 815 divided by second ants and get negative point, negative point zero five one eight. Then we can plug that A into, I'll plug it into this equation. So 1120, multiply that negative point five one eight times seven zero eight seven five and get minus my calculator is uh, broken I can't see all the numbers I'm just going to keep going though uh, three six three six seven four I better pause this for a second it's actually three six seven one Point three twenty five um, plus fifteen seventy five B. So do eleven twenty minus or actually plus three six seven one point three two five and finally divide that by 1575 and get 3.042 for B. So our equation. And disclaimer, I might have made a careless error here and there. Uh, T squared plus 3.042T plus 14. Uh, you could actually do quadratic regression on the three points and get the answer also. But maybe this is, it says find. It doesn't say you have to do it this systems of equations way. Then it says use the given data to find the average rate of change. So average rate of change um, between 35 and 45 days what they're getting at here, I think I'm going to uh, erase most of this. Hold on. So the average rate of change is basically the slope of this line, which is real easy to calculate because it's just 40. It's y2 minus y1. I'll, 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 I'll make this y2 so I don't have to deal with... I'm not going to avoid the negative, but that's okay. 57 minus 46 over 35 minus 45, get 10 in the denominator, get negative 11. So that is the slope. And that is what they asked for. They said, um, find the average rate of change. They want a decimal approximation. So looks like negative 1.1. So that's the slope. And now they ask us to use that. Um, compare the estimate, oh, use it to find on day 40. So here I am on day 46. If I stay on this line, it's going to be 46 and then six days beyond that. Not, is, is, is it for, they, they want on day, uh, on day 40, yeah. So six days beyond that. So it's going to be six times negative 1.1. Basically, it was at 46. Oh, I'm sorry. They, 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 this is a little confusing. They, they're asking about day 40. So day 40 is actually five days later because this is 45. But it's still 46 is my initial y value. So 46 um, minus 1.1 times 5 is 40.5. Now they ask, compare 
what you found in 2 to the value given by, compare the estimate found in 2, so you just found it, to the value given by the model, I of 40, which is, which is the answer that we got in, um, in part A, number two. Um, compare them using characteristics of the average and characteristics of the quadrant. Explain why the two things... Well, they're going to be different because one's a line and one's a parabola, so they're not going to be the same point. But you'd have to plug... I, I, I've already erased and gotten rid of my answer for the other one, but you would plug 40 into that other equation, whatever it was, negative point, you know, 5 t uh, times 40 squared, whatever it is, it would, um, it would come out to be something bigger than 40. So I of 40 is bigger than the estimate based on that line. Explain how the range values of the function of i should be limited by the context of the problem. So we're selling ice cream, so the range has to be bigger than zero because the worst thing you can do is, is sell no ice cream. You cannot sell negative ice cream. Like people come and sell you ice cream instead. I mean, I guess it's possible and you're buying it, so that's like negative ice cream. But I think what they're getting at here is that the range is um, y is greater than or equal to zero. It's actually also maybe integers. Maybe you can't buy half of an ice cream. Maybe you can. And that, sorry, I didn't have, I, I erased my function, so I wasn't able to compare it. I, I probably made a mistake in that first function anyway, so uh, it's better that we don't know. Okay, in this question, we have a metronome, which... Uh, if you don't know, it's like a thing that kind of, it, it, when you have a piano, you, it kind of goes back and forth. I don't think that most people use electronic metronomes now, so this isn't as familiar as in the last example when it was like a, a clock, but it goes like this. Tick, 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 tick. So, um, and they want to make a graph of how, what do they want to say? Metronome, which is a device to help them play. It has vertical center line as shown a pendulum swings back and forth past the vertical center line uh, the measure of the angle formed by the pendulum the furthest is half of a radian so this is half a radian radian's about 60 degrees a little less at t equals zero the pendulum is furthest to the left The pendulum then swings to the right, passes the vertical central line, C2 of the pendulum furthest to the right, and it swings left, passes the vertical. Okay. As the pendulum swings, the measure of the angle and the vertical. So they're actually talking about the angle here. So interesting. I guess, I guess what's going on is that when it's all the way to the left, which is how it starts, the angle is going to be negative because it's like this is positive half that's negative a half this is what i think and then it's going to eventually get to positive one half so it's zero it's at uh, negative one half that's that point at two seconds it's furthest to the right so then it's positive one half and then two more seconds it's furthest to the left halfway between it's going to be on the middle line and we have what looks like a cosine graph. Which is good because they, unlike in test one, they actually want to do, do a cosine graph. Um, so what do they want to know? Sinusoidal. Mm -hmm. Let me just make sure I've got all this right. At two seconds, it's furthest to the right. Then as it swings, mm -hmm, four seconds. Mm -hmm. The metronome is vertical center line, swings back and forth. 
Okay, I think this is right. So, um, they want to know FGH, FG, J, K, and P. So, this is at 2, is the high point. And the entire period is 1, 2, 3, 4. So, I would probably... Why don't I just... I've, it's hard to know exactly what to do here. I'm just going to make this one two seconds. So this is this point is two comma one half, and this point, halfway between, is just three comma zero, and four comma negative one half, which is here, and then back to five comma zero, and six comma one half. That's what I think. Uh, now they want an equation. I would make this equation, um, cosine usually starts at its high and ends, ends at its high. The middle line is zero, so that's easy enough. Um, the amplitude is a half. This is kind of strange because we're measuring, this y-axis is measuring the angle. It's not measuring like height, which it did in the first test. Uh, it's negative cosine, so I'll go negative one-half cosine. There's no shift because it's starting right at its starting point. But there is a sort of... So what I don't need for this, if they say uh, B, T plus C, we don't need a C. I'm just going to write zero to make drive that point home. Now the period is four, so the B value is always uh, 2 pi, at least with radians, over the period. 2 pi over 4, which is pi over 2. And that is the answer for, um, for B. Now, on the graph, they want to know um, between T1 and T2, where is that? Refer to the graph, oh, J to K. So from here to here, I'll use a different color. It's definitely increasing. But it's negative because this is zero, so it's under, so it's negative and increasing. And then they want to know how the rate of change is changing. Basically what they're getting at is if it's part of a smile, <clears throat> the rate of change is increasing. It's called concave up. But if it's part of a frown, the rate of change is decreasing. And this is definitely part of a smile. So rate of change is increasing. What that means is that if you look at the curve and kind of imagine it as split into lines, the slope is getting bigger, getting higher. It's getting more steep as it goes to the right. And that's going to end question number three. Question four. So here's some functions. Ooh, arc sine. I haven't seen that in a while. And a log. So they want five pi is equal to 15 arc sine x. Arc sine, sometimes they write it as, as that instead, but they wanted to use the old fashioned arc sine. So this reduces to pi over three equals arc sine x. And they're asking, um, they're asking, it's kind of funny, that, that what they're asking is, um, they're basically asking what sine of, are they asking what sine of pi over three? Let me think about this for a second. Yes, like if sine 30 equals one half, then arc sine of one half equals 30. So these are two ways of saying the same thing. So um, x is equal to sine of pi over three. Now sine of pi over three, I like degrees, so it's like sine of 60 degrees. And hopefully you know, and I highly recommend that you know your three main, or your, your three main angles, 
Sine of 30 is 1 half. Sine of 45 is radical 2 over 2. Sine of 60 is radical 3 over 2. Cosine goes backwards. And tan, you, you take the numerators and make a fraction out of it. 1 over root 3 simplifies to root 3 over 3. Root 2 over 2 equals 1. So these are the big 9 values. And in this case, sine of 60 is radical 3 over 2. Which is the answer for that one. Now, if what if I put 1 in for the h function? So this says log base 10 of 1 minus x minus log base 10 of 4. Now there's a log rule that when you do log minus log, you can write it as a single log as a quotient. There is also a thing with logs where we could rearrange log base 10 of you could take anything that's like log base b of a equals c and rewrite it as b to the c equals a. So here it's 10 to the 1 equals 1 minus x over 4. Cross multiply, 40 equals 1 minus x. And x is equal to negative 39. You have to actually make sure with logs that it doesn't make it undefined. If you, if you put negative 39 into the original and it would be okay because um, 1 minus negative 39 is positive 40, but we don't want the thing in the parentheses to ever become negative. So that takes care of 4a12. Okay, now for b, I'm going to erase all this stuff. Okay, for b, they have new functions, another log. So for 1, they want you to rewrite this log as a single log. So the way you do that is you use those rules. There are, th there are three rules. They are that log base b of x, y is equal to log b x plus log base b of y, and that log base b of x over y is log base b of x minus log base b of y, and that log base b of x to the a power is a times log b log base b of x. So here I have three things going on. Basically, you say log base 2, and all the positive ones you put in the numerator, multiplied together, and in the denominator, oh, I do like to use this rule first. Bring that 11 up here. And that's actually the answer for that question. Now, for 2, they have cotan times cosecant x. And they want you to write it as something with cosine of cosine. So cotan is 1 over tan, and tan is sine over cosine. So this is cosine over sine, and cosecant is 1 over sine. So it becomes cosine x over sine squared x. But there's a trig identity that sine squared x plus cosine squared x equals 1, which can be rearranged as sine squared x equals 1 minus cosine squared x. And that's actually the answer to this question. And finally, the last one is part C. So they have, um, they want to know when is the output 18. So it's um, 2, 2 to the x squared minus 3 times 2 to the x. Huh. Interesting. They, they, they actually have this kind of funny question the way they worded it. So you might be tempted to simplify 2 to the x squared, but actually it's better to leave it like that because what you do with this question is you bring... This thing has the form of a quadratic equation. You know, it kind of looks like 0 equals u squared minus 3u 
minus 18. Except instead of a u, there's a 2 to the x. But just like this u squared minus 3u minus 18, you would factor um, to u minus 6, u plus 3. Similarly, you would factor this to 2 to the x um, minus 6 times 2 to the x plus 3. Now you set each of those equal to 0. Now this one we can just reject because you can't, when you raise something to a power, you always get something positive. Even like 2 to the negative fourth power is not negative. It's 1 over 2 to the fourth is 1 over 16. But 2 to the x equals 6. Find all values in the domain. Um, so we write x equals log base 2 of 6. Now, I think this is the no calculator section, so you probably have to leave it just like that. So what I've just done is all the part twos in uh, sample test number two. If, if you did sample test number one, you can see that these questions are very, very similar. So... Um, if you practice all three part twos on the sample tests, you should be in good shape for the actual test.